For, for those of you who have no prior knowledge of Palmyra, beyond the name of its le legendary third century AD ruler, Zenobia, um, let me see if I can get there we go, um, through to those of you who know a lot more than me, um, I do hope you can take something away from this evening's talk. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to write them down or pop them in the chat and ask them at the end. It would be great to have a discussion after the talk for any of you who can stay on. A little introduction to me before we set off to Palmyra. I'm a third year PhD student working in the Classics and Ancient History Department at Durham University. And as Kay mentioned, I'm working on a thesis entitled The Reception of the Ruins of Palmyra. I deal with the afterlife of the ancient city, predominantly in the 18th century. I work with Professor Ted Kaiser, Dr. Edmund Thomas, and Dr. Nora Goldschmidt as my supervisory team. Rather than archeological excavation or other more traditional ancient source material, um, I, I use travel logs and other um, different paraphernalia around those who have visited the city um, over the past three and a half centuries since its rediscovery for the West. Despite the distance, the ruins of Palmyra sit deep in the Syrian steppe sandwiched between the Mediterranean coast and the Euphrates. The ancient city has long held a significant position in the European imagination. From its rediscovery for the West in the 17th century, and I mean this very much in inverted commas, as of course the contemporary town was known regionally and has been home to a continuous settlement for more than 2000 years. To the travelers who ventured to the ruins in the 18th and 19th centuries, the history of European interaction with the city has long been an important part of our understanding of the ancient world. From its idiosyncratic architecture and art through to its iconic leaders like Odonathus and Zenobia, Palmyra is as much a crucible of civilization as it is a fantasy empire that took on the likes of Aurelian and Chapur, the Romans and the Persians. Bridging east and west, both geographically and politically, the ruins have often been caught in the crossfire of conflicts over its cultural legacy. I believe the conflict over Palmyra's cultural identity is one of the many reasons the destructions of the ruins reverberated across every corner of Western media. It was a clamor to claim somewhere as ours, an attack on the classical, on European heritage. But I argue the outrage was as much about the assault on the history of our collective imagination as it was about militant extremists blowing up significant sections of a popular UNESCO World Heritage Site. The story of the West and Palmyra long predates the modern headlines and can be uncovered through an investigation into the history of the site enabled by classical reception. Owing to the onset of the Syrian civil war in 2011 and the destruction of many of the ancient city's major monuments, including the temples of Bel and Baal Shamin by Islamic State between 2015 and 2017, no new archeological research has been possible on site. Previously, Previously, teams from Poland, Norway, and as far afield as Japan had been conducting excavations at the ruins, but there is no likely return date for any of them due to the rise of Russian regional dominance. It is in, com in this context that classical reception has an important role to play in continuing research into places like Palmyra that are now otherwise off limits. In tonight's talk, I hope to give you a taster of the diverse range of sources that are available in the history of, in this case, three centuries of European exploration and interaction with the city. As an archeologist travels down through different layers of antiquity, so too can a student of classical reception. Tonight, we travel back in time to the height of the 19th century, when exotic locations like Ottoman Syria were becoming more accessible and Palmyra transformed into a destination for those looking for an extreme escape from stifling European society. My title, Porter's Palmyra, is a bit of a misnomer. Although the three works of Reverend Josias Leslie Porter are significant contributors to tonight's talk, the Northern Irish pastor represents a mid-century linchpin, allowing us to explore the ubiquitous accounts of Palmyra produced in the 19th century. I'd like to find out more about this Presbyterian minister who set off from his parish in Newcastle's Highbridge for Damascus in the late 1840s. His is exactly the sort of story that intrigues me and informs my thesis these tales of priests who took off on mission into the unknown and transformed our understanding of the region as a result of their curiosity and discoveries. Porter continued to publish on Palmyra after he had returned from Damascus and became an administrator back home at Queen's University Belfast. Clearly, 
The ancient site lived long in his memory, as it did for so many travellers. By 1851, Porter travelled a relatively well-trodden path to Palmyra. But if it wasn't for his forebears, then Palmyra may have lain buried in the sands of time in the Syrian steppe for many more centuries. In 1691, Reverend William Halifax, the chaplain as hatched to the Levant Company merchants at the Aleppo factory, became the first European to travel to and record an account of the ancient city. Accompanied by two merchants, Aaron Goodger and Timothy Lenoy, the Dutch draftsman, Gerard Hofstede of Van Essen, the expedition resulted in two articles for philosophical transactions, and the first panorama of the city, which we can see here, in its published engraving and oil canvas, an oil on canvas form. The image became a template for later illustrations with the same composition stretching from the Temple of Bell round to the medieval castle on the hill, common to many early engravings. The panorama became a visual representation of the traveler's itinerary and often included each of the monuments they had visited to accompany the text and or add authority to the account as a whole. In the 17th century, venturing into the limits of the Ottoman Empire, where a patchwork of local tribal factions had control, was riddled with risk and reward. The explorers from Aleppo had earlier failed to reach the ruins in 1678 and been victims of a hostage situation in which the local emir stripped them of everything they owned, down to the clothes on their backs. The inventory of the items they surrendered included $2,000, one half in money, the other half in goods, swords, clothes, tents, which the emir promised to estimate at their worth. Their time in Palmyra was limited to one humiliating night of accommodation, as the travellers wrote that the tribal leader desired us for greater security to pitch our tents under the town walls, which is in the ruins of a great palace, the wall yet standing very high, the town within but small, and the houses, excepting two or three, no better than hogsties. The visitors were at least left with their tents to enjoy a starlit desert night among these inauspicious hogsties. Perhaps not quite the arrival they had envis envisaged after an arduous journey across the desert. The rewards of attaining the ruins were only reaped some 13 years later as the intrepid adventurers reached Palmyra in 1691. In so doing, they made the first meaningful visit to the ruins, marking the true rediscovery of the city after their initial abortive attempt. Their discovery was picked up in the Anglophone world and across continental Europe, as academics and antiquarians sought more information on this significant classical and biblical site. However, Palmyra remained of little interest beyond the academy until the middle of the 18th century, although first French and then Swedish travellers ventured to the ancient city into the intervening decades, and it features in a number of architectural treatises and publications. Robert Wood's illustrated monograph, Ruins of Palmyra, released in 1753, marked the first time the ruins became a popular phenomenon and more widely circulated. Wood travelled to Palmyra as part of a large antiquarian expedition in 1751, and so was one of the first Westerners to see the site. With money behind the mission, James Jamaica Dawkins, an absentee plantation owner and slave trader in the Caribbean, and fellow Oxford graduate John Bouverie, who died en route, theirs was no amateur affair, but the first serious contribution to Palmyrene studies, or more inquisitive examination into the ruins, as Wood coined it. Dawkins donated over £50,000 to the venture and its ensuing publications, Ruins of Palmyra in 1753, and Ruins of Baalbek four years later. In today's terms, this sum is equivalent to a figure in the region of £10 million. Prefixed with a historical account, a description of their voyage through the desert, and plan of Palmyra, the final publication contained 57 engravings, including reconstructions and elevations of Palmyra's major monument. Wood's book became an important tributary to the classical revival, as draftman, draftsman Giovanni Battista Borra's engravings inspired many works of art and architecture. The city was transformed from a niche concern to a cornerstone of ancient architecture that touched the lecture illustrations Professor of Architecture at the Royal Academy, Sir John Soane, and the likes of Society of Dilettante founder, Sir Francis Dashwood. Borrow himself was responsible for translating the plates into patterns for stucco ceilings at the Stowe and Norfolk House, which triggered a Palmyrene taste in interior decoration 
over the next 25 years. Here is one famous example designed by Royal Architect Robert Adam at Ostley Park, later completed with an accompanying carpet. Proof of the more popular demand for all things Palmyrene came at Vauxhall Pleasure Gardens in London, where the owner, Jonathan Tyres, launched a Palmyra-inspired illusionary installation as early as 1754. Here we can see the artwork as it was reproduced to fool punters into thinking that Palmyra's iconic colonnade was integrated into the Grand Walk as they toured the gardens. Boasting a diverse range of attendees, the garden's summer soirees attracted aristocrats to more middle-class folk, meaning that an awareness of the ruins filtered down from the top echelons of society. If Palmyra became more widespread in popular culture in the 18th century, it was only in the 19th century that the possibility and desire among travelers to experience ruins, the ruins for themselves increased. Thus, Tonight's talk will investigate the rise in travel between 1813 and 1870, with a particular focus on the 1850s, when the presence of Jane Digby in Damascus meant Palmyra saw more European visitors than ever before, including Porter, the Burtons, Carl Haag, and Emily Ann Bother. Another attendant aspect of this trend was the predominance of women traveling to the ruins and publishing accounts of their experience. From Lady Hester Stanhope, seen here on the left, the first Western woman to see Palmyra, through to the Duchess of Devonshire on the right in 1897. Many women across the 19th century identified with Zenobia as a strong figure of empowerment. Whether this was in a domestic setting for an evening soiree or overseas at the site itself, the 19th century saw an expanding interest in all things Palmyra. Our story starts with the eccentric tale of Lady Hester Stanhope. Born into an aristocratic family in 1776, Stanhope was brought up by her uncle. This uncle happened to be William Pitt the Younger, the youngest ever British Prime Minister, who from the age of 24 was Prime Minister for almost 25 years, and whose townhouse in Bath recently went on sale for over three million pounds. Bachelor, Pitt employed his niece as a hostess for dignitaries visiting him at his other res residence, 10 Downing Street. When Pitt fell ill and died prematurely in 1806, Stanhope nursed him and was recognised in his will with a pension of £1,200 a year to live on. However, by the age of 33, unmarried, she had grown restless with the stifling nature of high society in England and headed east accompanied by a maid and a young doctor, Charles Merrion. Merrion later wrote up his account of his time with Stanhope, including her extant correspondence. One episode in particular will be our focus. In a letter of June 30th, 1813, Stanhope writes, Without joking, I have been crowned queen of the desert under the triumphal arch of Palmyra. Nothing ever succeeded better than this journey, dangerous as it was, for upon our return, we were pursued by 200 of the enemy's horse, but escaped from them. I shall soon have as many names as Apollo. I am the sun, the star, the pearl, the lion, the light from heaven, and the queen, which all sounds well in its way. On entering Palmyra and becoming the first Western woman to have done so, Stanhope promptly had herself crowned Queen of the Desert in one of the more bizarre moments in the history of the site. Any chance that the episode can be ignored as the raving of a megalomaniac is undermined by the credulity of her contemporaries. Fermandido, who was working at the French embassy in Constantinople, corroborated Stanhope's account in 1821. And I quote, she described in great detail and with a certain satisfaction how she had made her entry, lance in hand, in her oriental dress, followed by 30 camels, which had brought into the desert all that was choicest of European luxuries. She enumerated the many presents she had given to the sheikhs and told how she had, during three nights, illuminated the ruins of Palmyra, where she had herself crowned. I thought at the time that some oriental exaggeration must have adorned this narrative, but I afterwards heard from several persons who had accompanied her that it was, in the main, perfectly correct. If Palmyra had been waiting for a second Zenobia for some 1500 years, then Stanhope was happy to take up this mantle, visiting the ruins like a foreign luminary, in turn becoming not only queen, but the sun, the star, the pearl, the lion, and even the light from heaven. 
It is reported elsewhere that local women accompanied Stanhope down the city's iconic colonnade, and Marion encapsulated the spectacle in a single soundbite. She sought the remains of Zenobia's greatness, as well as the remains of Palmyra. Now, Stanhope's mission has often been analysed from the perspective of her personal biography, rather than analysing the relationship to the local population of Palmyra. For instance, the historian Philip Mansell states, she was the first of the long line of Western travellers who went east not for power, pleasure or scholarship, but to escape conventional society. While the escape from conventional society was certainly true in the case of many travellers to Palmyra, Stanhope's few days among the ruins represent a power trip for the Western woman cast off into the wilderness and crowned queen of the desert. Although it may not be actual political power, her venture into the unknown and ensuing power grab reflects more than a mere escape. I can't say I've ever travelled overseas, met with the locals to organise a triumphal procession, and then have myself crowned king on arrival. As a result, in the other accounts of the city that we will see later on tonight, I believe it is imperative to analyse the relationship between each traveller, and not only their individual experience of the ruins, but also their interaction with the people and place they describe. If we categorise each episode as mere escapism, we neglect to tell the whole story of the history of Western interaction with Palmyra as an actual place. Since antiquity, Palmyra has undergone several different afterlives. The Temple of Bell Precinct is perhaps the best witness to the tides of change, having been converted into a mosque and a village during the Ottoman period. Each traveller ventured to Palmyra to see the ruins, but also, out of necessity, came into contact with the community who lived within the temple. To ignore this aspect of the accounts is to tell history as a half-truth. Therefore, I will counterbalance an analysis of the descriptions of the ruins with the ways in which travellers portrayed the local people. Before all this, though, we had better arrive at the ruins in the first place, and getting there was often too much for most because it included a delicate balance of diplomacy and stamina. The irre irrepressible explorer and linguist, Sir Richard Francis Burton, best summarised the difficulties involved in travelling across the desert after his visit in 1870. He wrote, Until the present time, a traveller visiting Syria, perhaps expressly to see Tadmor, after having been kept for months in hopes, had to return as he came. Only the rich could, help at all, could hope at all, as it was necessary to hire a large Bedouin escort, for which even 6,000 francs and more had been demanded. Add to this the difficulties, hardships, and dangers of the journey. I allude to the heat of the arid desert, to the chance of attack, to want of water, and to long forced marches by night and hiding by day, thus seeing literally nothing of the country. Another drawback was the customary halt of two days at a place to see which so much had been sacrificed, and where 12 or 15 could be well spent. Thus Tadmor, except to a few English travellers, has been totally excluded from the Oriental tour. If this was indeed the case for many travellers into the mid-19th century, then things had changed by the time the Burtons arrived at Palmyra. Isabel Burton criticised the surplus of descriptions of the city in her own account of the ruins released in 1875, writing, So many travellers have described Palmyra, the city of the palms, that I shall be voted a bore if I attempt it again. A description and sketches of it are also found in most books of architecture. Still, I may make a few common remarks for those who prefer light literature. Palmyra had risen to prominence in what Burton termed light literature over the past 20 years, owing to the number of travellers who had reached the ruins and released travel logs. In 1879, Anne Blunt wrote of her visit that Palmyra must be too well known for any description of the ruins to be necessary. Clearly, it was no longer the case that Tadmor, Palmyra's name in Arabic, was excluded from the Oriental tour, although it was predominantly present in Anglophone accounts penned by British travellers at Burton and Blunt. Arriving at the ruins in 1851, Quarter authored three different publications on Palmyra, releasing a, large account, a larger account in 1855's Five Years in Damascus, which was largely reproduced in A Handbook for Travellers in Syria and Palestine. 
Some 10 years later, he penned an article entitled Palmyra in the Wilderness as Professor Porter after returning to Belfast to become a university administrator. Perhaps it was light literature like Porter's to which Burton directed her ire. Yet Porter wrote in the preface to his first book, Damascus, that, and hopefully this will work. The following work is not a book of travels penned during a summer's ramble or a winter's residence. It is the result of researches extending over a period of more than five years. Though I have wandered through most of Palestine, I have here confined my attention to a few provinces hitherto but little known. My object has been not so much as to amuse as to instruct. Instruction, rather than amusement, was Porter's objective. And though this may have been more obviously the case in Handbook for Travellers, five years in Damascus found enough room to amuse his readers. Porter's description of Palmyra represents a particularly purple passage. The author's experience began even before he set foot in the ruins. Porter becomes immersed in anticipation of the city en route. We could not withdraw our thoughts from Tadmor. We could not forget that that wonder of the desert was still before us and at only a few hours distant. We wondered whether it would disappoint our bright anticipations. As fellow traveller to the region, Emily Ann Botha wrote a few years later, the world famous ruins of Palmyra are naturally the common subject of conversation at Damascus. The traveller's experience of Palmyra began in their desire to reach the ruins and in the power of their imagination. Instilled with previous accounts, tales of the city and other hearsay, their imagination concocted an impression of the spectacle based on this archive of information. Porter enters the ruins in the hallucination of a daydream, only an hour away from this mirage in the desert. Eagerly did we fix our eyes on the long for spot and try to distinguish the form and character of the ruins. Doubts and fears were in a moment dispelled from our minds. The buildings could not be more than an hour distant, and already in pleasant anticipation, we were in the midst of those colonnades and porticos and proud memorials of the wealth and power of bygone ages. Columns and friezes and tottering walls and sculpted stones half buried in the desert stands were before the mind's eye. We rejoiced to picture the nature of the first impressions the ruins would make upon us. A first experience of the ruins of Palmyra was years in the making for many of these travellers, as their knowledge of the city manifested in a desire to see the Venice of the Sands for themselves. Porter's desire is palpable in his diction, the use of the word eagerly. His desperation identifiable in the verb fix, culminating in the object of desire, that longed for spot. This pleasant anticipation transforms into a trip into the mind's eye, where Porter explores elements of the city's architecture still an hour distant. He talks of first impressions, but to a certain extent, any natural reaction had been mediated through witnessing the city's sites in other travel accounts and plates in publications. Chiefly, this remained with the seminal ruins of Palmyra, but the French had also contributed to the canon of works available to Porter, with Palmyra featuring in Louis-Francois Cassard's Voyage Pittoresque and Léon de Laborde's Voyage de la Syrie. Porter's preliminary passage was written after he had visited the ruins, and so adds to the sense of dramatic suspense before the protagonist, Palmyra, enters the stage. But even for the earliest of our travellers studied today, there was a premeditated aspect to his initial response to the ruins. By the time the traveller reached the ruins, he found them pretty much as anticipated, though the account strangely shifts into the third person to take in the panorama. The whole panorama of the ruins opens up before him. They stretch from the base of the mountains across the valley, on the left until they are terminated by the lofty walls of the magnificent Temple of the Sun directly in front. He is struck with astonishment at their vast extent, and no less so at their utter desolation. They are white as snow reeds. Not a tree, or shrub, or blade of grass, or solitary weed is seen among them. Heaps of massive stones, noble porticos, and long and beautiful colonnades are intermixed with the shattered ruins of temples, triumphal arches, 
and proud monuments erected in honour of the mighty dead. There is no sign of life, all is barren, desolate as a deserted cemetery. Whether Porter's use of the third person was an attempt to universalise the experience, elements of his count were all, excuse me, whether Porter's use of the third person was an attempt to universalise the experience, elements of his count would be replicated in many publications. Each of our travellers from Porter in 1851 through to Burton in 1870 produced a purple passage to recognise their long-awaited arrival after days of travel across the Syrian steppe. But none of these accounts could rival Emily Ann Beaufort's 50-page travelogue of her journey to Palmyra, complete with poem and plates after her drawings completed on the spot. Beaufort travelled to the east with her elder sister in 1858 and was another who chased escapism from the norms of society before marrying into the title Lady Strangford in her return. Like Porter, Beaufort registers her eagerness to enter the city and records a similar experience of the deathly quality of the city. Like many ancient sites, visitors pass through the city of the dead before setting foot in the settlement itself. In Palmyra's case, the totemic tower tombs made the presence of the dead all the more obvious on arrival and were often the main focus of travellers' inquiry, as was the case with Sir Richard Francis Burton. Travellers were preoccupied with the pervasive shroud of death, which seemed to subsume the city, and it appealed to their imagination. Beaufort writes, Palmyra seemed to me, from the first instance I saw it, stretched out before me in all its investiture of bright colours, like a fair maiden, a flower-crowned bride, lying down in a repose that was really death, though it seemed only a deep sleep, with her white robes and her fair flowers still around her, they living though she was dead, floating down the stream of time. As an arrival scene, the description is an elegant first encounter with Palmyra. Beaufort uses the simile of the fair maiden for the ancient city. It is an arresting and beautiful description of the ruins, refashioned in affectionate tones as a fairy tale fantasy figure, dead on the bridal day, that manages to be both morbid and melancholic. The passage has a gothic atmosphere with a sense of melodrama at odds with the joyous celebration of the first view of Palmyra, which brims with excitement on Beaufort's arrival at the ruins. What can be more beautiful, more glorious in all the world than the view that burst upon our eyes? There, like nothing in nature, but the first time one sees the wide ocean spread before one, lay the desert in its apparently boundless infinitude, glowing in radiant colours of unnumbered variety, while, like jewels laid upon her fair bosom, stood Tadmor, though in ruins still empress of the plain, majestically grand. First, though furthest off, the Temple of the Sun rose up in giant massiveness. Then, as we advanced another step, the splendid colonnade, the triumphal arch, its noble gateway. One building succeeded another, each and all dazzlingly white, save where touched with shining gold or rosy pink. How absolutely interminable it seemed, as column succeeded column in endless succession, up to the very mountain foot, meeting other colonnades which branched off at right angles and then faded down in ruins. Lone columns stood up here and there, and those of the amphitheatre curved round in a broken semicircle, amidst the miles and miles of scattered stones, broken pillars, fallen pediments, and huge blocks, which covered the whole ground. A few dark masses stood out from among the light columns. These were the platforms of smaller temples and halls, and one, the palace of Spor Zenobia. Apologies, I missed a couple of transitions there, but those were a few of the sites that Beaufort was talking about, as of course they looked before. 2015, 2017. Three of the locations Beaufort included in the description are sadly now either mutilated or flattened. The Temple of the Sun or Temple of Bell, the Triumphal Arch and the Theatre have all been shattered by dynamite. Thus, Tadmor, though in ruins, still Empress of the Plain, majestically grand, becomes an evocation of a now lost vista that presented itself to Beaufort back in 1859. They now live on in the collective memory of those who saw and recorded them. There is a preoccupation with colour evident in Beaufort's description of the ruins and elsewhere in her account. We get a sense of Beaufort's eye scanning across the horizon and attempting to put words to the scene she, she surveys. One building succeeded another, each and all dazzlingly white, save where touched with shining gold or rosy pink. The author's fascination with colour resurfaces again later in the account. 
Streak after streak of colours filling up that space, in despair of catching them by any other means, I have scribbled down upon the margins of my drawings a score of descriptions of the view at that moment before me. Such as this, beginning with the foreground. Brown, dark red, violet, lilac, gold, rose, crimson, pale green, orange, indigo blue, sky blue. These all blending into delicious, strange, incalculable harmonies, ever and ever changing. Every effect seemed the most beautiful, and one wished it to last forever. When, in another two minutes, all would be changed into something so much lovelier still, one never knew whether one admired or wondered the most. Many and many a time, anxious though I was to draw all I could, my pencil stood still in my hand while I was engrossed in watching the rapid and beautiful changes which no brush could copy and no tongue describe. We share in both its attempt to vocalise the canvas of colour presented in this scene. The author points to the inadequacy of either art or word to, to replicate what she had seen. The picturesque aspect of the view of Palmyra is evident in the traveller's interaction with the site as though it is a painting rather than an actual landscape. Porter shares a similar perception of the picturesque quality of the ruins. The colonnade of Tadmore forms one of the most imposing pictures in the world. I was never tired of looking at it. I saw some new and striking feature from every point of view. Porter does not refer to the colonnade as a view, but believes it to be one of the most imposing pictures in the world. The picturesque interaction with the city reached such an extent that the ruins themselves became a picture rather than a place in the accounts of travellers. Porter's account of the ruins is revealing because the view of Palmyra is caught in a state of flux between the different technologies of the time. What was at first a picture is next transformed into a photograph, as Porter writes. I clambered up the hill, scaled the shattered battlements, and took my seat on the top of its highest tower. I can never forget that view. It is photographed on my memory in all its vast extent, in all its wild grandeur, in all its strange and terrible desolation. Photography was a new phenomenon to Porter and Palmyra. He could not have seen the first photos of the ruins taken by Louis Van just a year earlier in 1864. Yet the ruins are photographed on his memory. The verb perfectly encapsulates the potency of the view upon our travellers. In the subsequent passage, Porter uses the analogy of a painting to describe his reaction to the landscape. The mountains had a dreamy, ethereal look, such as one sees in some of the wondrous pictures of Turner. On the east, a glowing horizon swept round a semicircle of unbroken snow-white plain. At my feet lay the ruins of the desert city, magnificent even in their utter desolation. Porter returns to the picturesque quality of the ruins within a landscape while maintaining a contemporary reference to the works of Turner, who coincidentally died in the same year that Porter reached Palmyra. The expressionism of Turner's works reflected what Porter experienced as he compared the view to the brushstrokes of Britain's leading watercolour artist. On the relationship between the visual and the literary, Mary Louise Pratt has argued that artists, especially landscape painters, had a formative influence on travellers who utilised pictorial symbolism and conventions. The travelogues of women in particular draw on visual images. Many of the travellers also doubled as painters. Beaufort's publication featured plates of the triumphal arch and a panorama of the city in her own hand. The presence of depictions of Palmyra alone demonstrates the indelible nature of the view on Beaufort, who put the ruins before any of the other sites she visited in Syria and Egypt. While Beaufort's works are quite stale in their amateurishness, putting weight behind a belief that no brush could copy what she saw, there was a more accomplished artist on the same expedition. In Damascus, Beaufort met Karl Haag, the German landscape painter, best known today for his royal commissions in the V&A and Royal Collections Trust. Beaufort and company happened upon Haag after his time at Balmoral on a tour of Egypt and Syria, which coincided with Beaufort's itinerary. Like Emily Ann, Haag used his time amid the ruins to commence a number of large-scale landscapes completed on his return to Europe. Beaufort praised his progress. 
Mr. Hogg's beautiful sketches proceeded with great rapidity. The people molested him very, very little. And I am certain some of those who did see him at work believe that his drawings were done by magic. It was a great thing to get out of the way of the rude curiosity of the townspeople. Hogg produced around a dozen watercolours of Palmyra. They are among the most popular and expensive lots when his works come up for auction. While many have disappeared into private collections, a few remain in the public eye. If we look at Hogg's version of the panorama that we can see here, the arch, which is now in the V&A, there are compositional similarities with both of those works. In the case of the arch especially, Hogg's professional abilities are apparent in the almost photographic quality to the reproduction. The arch is realized with a forensic attention to archeological detail while retaining enough of an emphasis on the setting to reflect a sense of its context within the urban space and landscape. Meanwhile, the scraping skies add a strong color contrast which offset the primary monuments in the foreground, capturing the spectrum of shades inherent to the stone and prevalent in the traveler's account. However, it is this painting of the ruins of the Temple of the Sun, dated to 1859, which truly captures the quality of light the travelers appreciated on site. Although the artist has taken some license with the raised perspective of the temple precinct, the artwork depicts faithfully a caravan of dromedaries moving across the scene as the sunrise peers through the ruins. While the arch at the top of the, pot, uh, the, the, top of the colonnade can be seen to the right, the oasis is represented to the left by a dozen palm trees poking out of the otherwise barren landscape. Hogg's Palmyra masterpiece is a distillation of the desert surrounds with the open shades descending into the darkness of the shadows, reflecting the unique play of light at the site. Like many of the travelers, Hogg fondly focalized his experience of the people of the desert through the transitory presence of the Bedouin tribesmen. Yet we see in Beaufort's description of Hogg's work, the seeds of the traveler's response to Palmyra's residence within the Temple of Bel, who molested him very little, and demonstrated their rude curiosity. This assessment is nothing compared to the eye of the likes of Beaufort and Burton reserved for the native population. Beaufort wrote, as great things stoop to mean uses, this wall now encloses the whole town of Tadmor. The miserable hovels thickly fill up every portion of the court, clustering in the corners round the columns up to their very capitals, hanging on to the carved ornaments like decayed bird's nests, and poisoning the once sacred enclosure with fetid squalor and indescribable filth. It is almost impossible to get any general idea of the ruins, even as they are, through this horrible swarm. And probably before many generations have passed, these people would have succeeded in destroying every vestige of the interior of this once glorious edifice. In the photo you can see in front of you, you get an idea of these temporary buildings that were made out of mud brick that occupied the terminus of the Temple of Bell. Um, and yeah, I mean, they were very much built up against the walls, but I think certainly from a, a modern um, architectural perspective, they are fascinating buildings in their own right of just how um, you know, these desert dwellers could still live and um, create these, these incredible buildings out of Things that were available to them in their local surrounds. Beaufort's description of the ruins is tainted by her experience of these local dwellings. The author laments the decline of Tadmor before turning attention to the miserable hovels through which Beaufort both denigrates and dehumanizes Palmyra's people through the simile like decayed bird's nests. The once pagan pur purpose of the temple is forgotten as the sacred enclosure is contrasted against the fetid squalor and indescribable filth with which it is poisoned. The traveller employs the metaphor of a horrible swarm to transform the hovels into an apocalyptic epidemic that erodes the general idea of the ruins. Homes come in the way of the aesthete's panoramic enjoyment of this once glorious edifice. The people do not care to preserve the ruins, but continue to destroy every vestige of the interior with little hope for the future. Beaufort's description set the parameters for later Victorian encounters with Palmyra's locals, as witnessed in Burton's writing. 
The idea of pestilence resurfaces, but on this occasion it is more grotesque with wasp's nest, representing a nastier plague. Burton wrote, The village resembles a group of wasp's nests on a large scale, clinging to the inside walls of a giant, gigantic, ruined temple. The people are hideous, poor, dirty, ragged and diseased. Everybody has ophthalmia and you feel to catch it by looking at them. They look as if born for misery. What have the descendants of Zenobia done to come to this? Like Botha, Burton compares the current state of the population in Palmyra to the ancient glory of the place to underline the deterioration through the juxtaposition, asking the question, what have the descendants of Zenobia done to come to this? The local populace are used as evidence for this degradation. In the rhetoric of empire, David Spar outlines that the traveller's interaction with the place and the people was never innocent, instead representing the colonial gaze, which is, and I quote, a mode of thinking wherein the world is radically transformed into an object of possession. The gaze is never innocent or pure. The writer's eye is always in some sense colonizing the landscape, mastering and positioning, fixing zones and poles, arranging and deepening the scene as the object of desire. The traveller's supremacy over the scene was heightened by the presence of the inhabitants in the temple, whom both had termed the most unmitigated barbarians and fellaheen of the lowest order. This was contrasted against their appreciation of Bedouin and paved the way for more overtly colonialist attitudes to develop. They climaxed in the bizarre claim made by Anne Blunt, who arrived at the ruins a little after the Burtons. Famed for her horsemanship more than her historical prowess, Blunt wrote of the Temple of Bell. The walls have at some more recent time been built up again and patched out of the older Roman materials. The gateway is Saracenic. The effect of this medley, though architecturally a barbarism, is very picturesque and serves to mark the history of the place. Some of the blocks of stone are prodigious enough to move to admiration, even the Tudmuri, who would have it that they were put there by Suleiman ibn Daud. Others, on the contrary, affirm that the English once had possession of the country, long before the days of Solomon, and were the real builders of the city. We have constantly been asked about this latter point of history, both here and in Mesopotamia, but are quite unable to account for the belief, which is certainly prevalent, of England's claim to all this part of Arabia. The belief would be strong enough to prepare the way for any new occupation or annexation, if such were ever projected. As Porter and Botha have done before, Blunt also remarks on the picturesque ruined architecture, which, lead, which leads her to reflect on the origins of Palmyra's medley. Blunt cites the authority of the Tudmuri for the belief that Suleiman, or Solomon, was responsible for this barbaric picturesque scene. It is also written in the Hebrew Bible that the son of David constructed Tabor in the wilderness. It was a theory reported by many early travellers, even if they did not necessarily believe it to be true. Extraordinarily, Blunt uses Solomon as a launch pad to an unsubstantiated claim that it was in fact the English who were the real builders of the city. Reflecting the times, Blunt sinks from this fantastical fake news to pave the way for England's claim to the whole of Arabia. Such loaded contemporary terms were used within the administration of the largest empire in the world and suggest that this was no idle point of interest for readers. Quite how we got from the origin of ancient ruins to Solomon, to the British colonization of Arabia in so short a passage, can only be the product of a colonialist traveler whose very presence in the region reflected her supremacy over the people and places she saw. From Stanhope, the self-proclaimed queen of the desert, to Blunt's imperially loaded language, clearly much changed over the course of 70 years in British interaction with Palmyra. In the final part of tonight's talk, I want to introduce, introduce the one woman whose story, I believe, reveals another side to Western interaction with the ancient city we have seen so far. At first sight, Jane Digby was another of the English elite aristocratic women who abandoned first Britain and then Europe in the pursuit of something different. With the reputation tarnished by her divorce from Lord Ellenborough, a scandal which struck the front page of the Times, and compounded by years of romantic exploits, 
across Europe with numerous gentry from Germany to Greece. Digby arrived in Syria with perhaps the best reason of any to desire a desert escapade. On arriving at the ruins for the first time on Christmas Day, 1853, Digby wrote in a diary that Palmyra was the greatest adventure, probably of all my adventures. This would turn into quite the understatement, for Digby conducted perhaps most outrageous and most genuine love affair and married the local sheikh of the Bedouin tribes in control of the desert around Palmyra, Merjwal al Mesrab in 1855. Botha gave him the highest praise imaginable when meeting the sheikh in 1859, writing that the best bred, polished English gentleman is not more polished than he, and the Bedouin chief joins an easy, chivalrous grace to his quiet, dignified demeanour, which has a double charm. The happy couple enjoyed quite the honeymoon in Palmyra, as Digby revealed in her diaries, ever Ever shall I remember the happy fortnight I passed there. It may have been more, for in the all-engrossing happiness of the honeymoon, I have forgotten both time and date. Can this be Elysium at last? Oh, for the last 20 or even 10 years over again, that I might adopt the desert life and really like it as I do now. Here we can see the portraits of the El Mesrabs, Karl Haag painted for the couple in 1859 in which we can see to what extent Digby had adopted the desert life. If Digby naturally occupies the central position, the ruins are unmistakably Palmyra in the fastidious rendering of the triumphal arch and colonnade which comprise the backdrop. By contrast, if we look to Steeler's portrait for the Bavarian King Ludwig I, it is an encapsulation of the persona Digby was attempting to escape in the desert. The cosmetic changes make Digby unrecognisable from the haughty younger figure that set the European gentry alight. On the surface, Digby contributes to the Orientalism of previously discussed figures in relating the absurdity of her own situation. She wrote, Who would have thought that the ridiculously exclusive and fine Lady Ellenborough of 30 years ago would bear to sit down, even in near neighbourhood, with the dirty and rude fella of Palmyra? Time, age, and circumstances change almost one's very nature. Though the transformation reflects some of the orientalizing overtones of other writers with words like rude and dirty, Digby had a great deal of affection for the place, the people, and the ruins which can best be witnessed in her artwork. Anne Blunt mentions Digby's portfolio in passing in her own account, writing that among many interesting and beautiful sketches kept in a portfolio, I saw some really fine watercolour views of Palmyra done by Mrs Digby many years ago, when that town was less well known than it is at present. At Minton House in Dorset, Digby's descendants have preserved much of the archival material around this doyen of the desert. The late Lord Digby collected many of the diaries, letters and sketchbooks of his ancestor, and the biographer Mary Lovell, who I'm pleased to say is here tonight, has catalogued the more disparate elements buried deep in innumerable boxes. I visited Minton on a pleasant summer's day during my master's and took photographs of a selection of Jane Digby's drawings of Palmyra. On the left, we see an example of one of the sketchbooks, but the framed works can be seen scattered across the house from the guest bedroom to the downstairs lavatory. The artwork we see here was found directly above the toilet and shows the terminus of the Temple of Bell complete with an arriving caravan. With an almost cartoonish effect, Digby captures the chaos of the caravan descending on the ruins while capturing the recognisable detail of the ruin. As the largest and one of the best preserved structures on site, the temple features prominently throughout Digby's drawings. Here we can see the sanctuary raised on an ac acropolis in the background, reminiscent of Hag's piece you'll remember from earlier with what earlier travellers thought to be the Palace of Zenobia in the foreground. Digby also explored a lesser known perspective of the temple by investigating the reverse angle. Perhaps this was due to the time she spent at the ruins over multiple visits, meaning unlike the other travellers, she could draw from less familiar spots, which I believe we can see to the, to the right in the foreground. Most likely Digby in a dromedary, um, spending a bit of time enjoying their view of the Temple of Bell there. Her version of the arch again showcases parallels with Karl Haag's, someone whom she surely met to compare drafts, 
and discuss their experiences. A few years earlier, during her 1856 journey to Palmyra with El Mezrab, Digby wrote in her diary, I put on all my Arab fantasia for the good of the public. And she states in a tongue-in-cheek fashion that Tadmor was now my domain. Due to her growing influence in the region, Digby led groups of Western tourists and travellers from her home in Damascus to the ruins with the support of El Mezrab's tribesmen, who provided a caravan and ensured their safe passage. Having transformed herself into a desert dweller, Digby's arrival scene does not drip with the imperialism of her predecessors or chime with the hackneyed words of Isabel Burson or Al Blunt, but carves a niche personal to Digby. On the 11th of June, 1864, Digby writes in her journal. After luncheon, we caught sight of the well-known, to me, pyramidical hills that descend upon Tadmor, still far, far off in the slight blue distance. We went the whole day without stopping, mostly trotting in order to get in before sunset, and at last attained the last hill and the ever-glorious panorama of Tadmor and its long-departed glories they stretched before it. Alas, half an hour too late, for the sun no longer brightly illuminated the colonnade. The columns were white instead of golden, as I wished them to be. Still, the party were astounded, and our entry to Palmyra was like a triumph all the villagers turning out to shout a welcome. Digby, with the eye of an artist traveller, fixated upon the transitions of colour possible at Palmyra. The depiction reads like a parody of the arrival scenes in other contemporary accounts. Though the ghosts of Hester Stanhope's entrance resurface, our entry to Palmyra was like a triumph, the context is innocent as the villagers merely appreciate the arrival of the, by then, well-known local leader. Rather than with the sense of possession, the failure to reach the ruins at the perfect moment reads with a sense of self-depreciation. Though the party were astounded, it is only for us, the clandestine later readers of Digby's diary, to know that their impressions of the ruins were in fact distinctly ordinary by Digby's standards. The travellers do not attain the ruins at the perfect moment and arrive half an hour too late, rendering the golden hues of the Palmyrene sunset a stark white, something which I think this sketch captures. It was a view of the ruins Digby had grown accustomed to over the years, and as a result, she could appreciate at what precise time they revealed their utmost beauty. Digby drew on her own experiences and a catalogue of memories. While the likes of Beaufort, Blunt, Burton, and to a degree Porter, recorded the superficial accounts of a tourist, Digby lived the ruins. Her diaries and art are witness to a passion for Palmyra that outlives the various other accounts we have seen. Digby was uniquely positioned to appreciate Palmyra for more than its picturesque qualities and as to understand it as a place more than a postcard. Although the city was so much more to Jane Digby al Mazrab, Palmyra has always been foremost a pretty view to a Western audience. The view has been replicated and reduplicated by each person to have been there, and the city has bestowed a little bit, a little, uh, and the city has bestowed, bestowed a little of its legacy once translated into a travelogue, a letter, a sketch, or a photo. I believe it is the etching of the first view of Palmyra onto our collective retina over many generations, which has made the destruction of its monuments such headline news. It is the sight we see rather than the sight we experience that has shaped the legacy of Palmyra for a European audience. When this view is altered by events like the atrocity of its destruction, it is picked up by journalists and commentators and has an instant impact on their audience. This is no modern phenomenon that can be charted through the centuries. As much as today it is the Telegraph or Le Monde which drive our interpretation of Palmyra's legacy, it is founded on the history of our interaction with the site, conducted over generations of visitors. Palmyra lives on in the imagination and memory above and beyond the site alone. But most of the time, a visit to Palmyra translates into a story. And whatever happens next, I hope there are plenty more chapters to come. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>